Okay, so our, our next presenter uh, has traveled here from the beautiful city of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, specifically the village of Kohler, and uh, you know, f very fabled uh, history of uh, some Austrian immigrants, uh, you know, the, when, they, when they moved uh, out of one particular part of, uh, of Wisconsin to go found this village, before they were done building the original factory, the whole place burned to the ground. And uh, the, uh, the three sons rebought the business from uh, one of the partners and, and continued you know, to, to live, live the, uh, the future dream of, of the Kohler company. And so um, there's a lot of golf. I'm sure you heard of Whistling Straits. We haven't been there yet. Um, they have a lot of spa type of stuff at Kohler. I'm sure you've heard of the, the fabled uh, Kohler spas. I think Jim's brought coupons for everybody. Oh, no? Oh, oh. All right, next time. Okay. Um, so Jim is a, uh, is a legacy employee of, of uh, Kohler Company. His, his dad was an employee there. He's been there for 23 years. Uh, and he's had a number of different roles in plastics operations. So staff engineer, process manufacturing engineer, department supervisor, production supervisor, plant superintendent, mold shop supervisor, and NPD group lead. Uh, he's got a couple little girls that he loves very much, and he uh, loves hunting as well. You'll find him in a, in a duck blind this coming weekend. So will you please help me in welcoming Mr. Jim Jacobs. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric, wavy when I turn it on. Off from my city, off from my home. Hello. Is this thing on? All right. Good afternoon. So um, I'm uh, Jim Jacobs with Kohler Company. I'm going to be going through uh, an example of how we applied and, and use Oros. So we've been using it for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, I'll start out with some background, kind of how I fit in the large uh, global organization of, of Kohler Company. Um, kind of what we do, and then uh, the problem that we were trying to solve, and then I'll get into um, a high-level um, look at, at how we applied it. Um, but then um, um, I didn't want to, you know, I'm one of those guys that I'm working always in the details, always in the weeds. So to, to kind of explain what we do um, as a whole, I, I tried to keep things high-level. If you guys want some more details or whatever, there's definitely... Um, um, You'll save your questions to the end or whatever. We'll definitely spend some time there. So um, I'm the uh, manager of manufacturing engineering right now. So um, um, Kohler Company is, is, um, has like uh, four different groups, right? There's a power system group that makes the uh, generators, uh, engines. There's the fixtures group. There's hospitality group. We even have a furniture business. So I'm in the um, fixtures world. We make the bathroom and, and um, uh, uh, kitchen fixtures. Uh, within uh, the fixtures, there's a shower and bathing department um, and business, and that's what I, I am a part of as uh, manufacturing engineering. Our department roles, uh, we do uh, project management for large capital projects for our plastics plants and um, cost out projects. And then we also do new product integration, and that's the um, specific application that we found uh, a, a very, um, um, we think, a, a good solution for some of the issues that we had there. Um, as part of our um, manufacturing engineering group, we also have a mold shop, a plastics mold shop, where we make, we design and, and build all the tooling for our new product uh, development launches. So. Um, the material set that we're talking about here are, is specifically acrylic, um, thermoform acrylic um, that's reinforced with um, fiberglass um, to make bathtubs, whirlpools, shower receptors, those type of products. Um, basically, when we, when we launch a, a new product, there's, there's three parts of our, three fundamental parts of our, um, our world that kind of come together. One is the product design, that engineering, product engineering and, um, and those folks own. Then there's the process requirements from our plants and then there's the tooling requirements. Um, the tooling requirements are, are kind of unique, um, that we feel is unique and, and a major part of this because plastic shrinks. So when you thermoform acrylic, um, 
um, the acrylic shell will shrink. When you fiberglass it, uh, that shrinks some more. So if you want a 60 inch bathtub, uh, like our, our product engineers designed, we have to make the tools and everything bigger uh, to get there. So um, all of those requirements and, and lessons learned, um, you know, kind of roll up into the, um, the tooling requirements. So just an example of some of the products that we um, um, are responsible for. We have a couple freestanding tubs there. We have a, a tub and a, and a shroud that kind of go together. Uh, we have uh, an alcove um, bathtub there with an apron, an integral apron on the lower left, and then a typical drop-in bathtub whirlpool on the, on the lower right there. So those are the products that we're, we're, we're talking about here. Um, our new product development process is pretty, um, pretty standard. I'm sure most people are, are uh, familiar with this, but we'd come up with a product design. Um, from there, then we do our tooling design. Uh, we'll go into our mold construction, and then there's a tooling validation point there. Um, we go into our product verification. Once the tools get into the, the plant, we get our, our product verification and our launch process. And then we have ongoing quality control. Um, each point in our process, there's a deliverable. And um, you can see here the various uh, deliverables. We have uh, you know, technical design review that product engineering um, owns, uh, CAD pattern review. This is a, the CAD review of our tooling design that we own before we actually cut our tooling. Um, once we build the tool, there's tooling validation. Um, we have our performance test plans for the product. And then um, as a part of our ongoing process controls, we have controls within our process, but we also do what's called a packware audit, where we actually pull product off our production lines or out of our, world, our warehouses and do a full-blown audit on these things. Um, like other stories, um, I'm sure you all have heard, all of these reside in different locations. Um, you can see some of these are in Word, some of these are Excel. Our packware audits were actually pieces of paper um, that can be shared with nobody. <laughs> um, and then they're all stored at different locations too. So some on shared networks, some on, on SharePoint, and some on uh, safely on somebody's desktop. So um, not a lot of, uh, of information sharing and collaboration here. And, and if we wanted to see how we performed in a launch two or three years ago, it's a, it's a major research project to try and figure out um, where all this information is uh, who owns it, and then once you do get it, you find it in different formats. So um, some of the, the problems that we had that we wanted to try to, try to solve here, um, one is our product engineering department. We have a high turnover rate, relatively high turnover rate in that department. So our product engineers last two to three years, maybe, if I was to generalize there. Um, and usually it takes one to two years to go through a cycle, a launch cycle, and understand our plastics business. So um, that's a big resource drain for my group to con you know, continuously train um, other engineers and explain to them you know, why we have requirements and, and um, we tend to, to make the same mistakes over again. Um, on the other end of our spectrum, in my department, we have a lot of high seniority guys with a lot of knowledge um, in our mold shop alone, five associates are over 90 years of combined experience. These guys pretty much made every tool that's in our plastics plant today. Um, but they're, they're not spring chickens anymore running around. So <laughs> um, there's an opportunity there to um, capture their knowledge and, and figure out a better way of, of communicating that knowledge. So, you know, the, the, the three... Um, kind of object objectives when I kind of reflect on, on what we're trying to solve here is uh, you know, how do we better communicate the requirements to new associates, to new engineers? Um, how do we capture the technical knowledge of our manufacturing associates? And how do we make our data more available and, and, and usable? Um, so then I was, it was 2016, I was in our Spartanburg plant and I was fighting a fire down there and I get a cold call from Jeff and he's trying to explain over the phone that uh, he's got a software that will do all of this. And I'm like, well, all right, you're either crazy or we have to sit down. And <laughs> uh, he came up to Wisconsin and um, we gave it a try and it's, it's working quite well. I'm pretty happy with it so far. 
So just going through the process of how we, how we did this, first of all, we um, captured the knowledge that we had. So a lot of our requirements uh, were already in Word documents and Excel documents and other formats. So um, the Oral's team here helped us a lot with converting those into, into KPAX. So we got our product engineering KPAX from a product uh, performance standpoint. All of our tooling knowledge we were able to um, put into KPAX. And then the requirements from the plants, uh, we were able to put into process KPAX. Um, as part of this, the, um, we had to think about how, how and when all of these requirements should be applied. So uh, the attributes that were, were important in our business um, are, are kind of summarized here. So we got two different type material types, three different types of installation, uh, product type, and then of course the, the step in our process. Um, a lot of these requirements only, only um, apply to a certain material or ter certain installation. So when we look back at our, our simple Excel check checklists, those were very complicated. We had multiple versions for different, different applications, and to keep those up to date was a project in itself. Um, and they, they were never up to date. So we had like an, even though we went through our checklist, we had like 85% confidence we had everything captured there. We were kind of always um, losing sleep that we might have forgot something since the last time we launched a product. Um, and I guess to put this into perspective, we, we only launched a new bathtub, say every eight or 10 months. So we're not going through this, you know, every few weeks, it's, um, it's a long duration for, for us. So what we forgot about eight months ago is <laughs> worth losing sleep over. So once we, um, we, we built up our K-Packs and we, we put in our, our attributes, um, we we're able to use the assessment control for um, the various steps of our process. Um, to, um, to list out the requirements that apply for that particular product type and step in our process. So this is just one example of, um, I think this is a, a tooling check. So you can see the different um, KPAX, our value tables. Um, we tend to use the discussion um, more than issues today. Our, um, <clears throat> we're finding that our um, our K packs are evolving because we, we, we never had such a, a clear view of our requirements before and our actual performance. So now we go through a process and we look at this and it's like, you know, we don't meet this requirement, but we haven't met this requirement for the last four years. And we've been shipping product and we don't have a field issue, so should we relook at the requirement? So a lot of this stuff um, simply is identified in a discussion. And at this phase, we'll go back and just update the KPAC when we're all in agreement. Um, if there's a more significant issue that, that, um, that's found, then we'll, we'll identify um, or actually raise an issue and, and track it form formally that way with um, action items and, order, and owners and that stuff. Um, yeah, so then obviously once we put in our information in the uh, value table, it tells us if we if we pass or fail, um, that, that information is, is then um, tracked and that is, is documented within the assessment control and within the KPAC for future reference, uh, which is extremely valuable to us. <clears throat> but one of the really interesting things were well, that when we kind of look back at this process, um, that should have been obvious in the beginning but never was, um, if you looked at all the, the product engineering KPACs, the tooling KPACs, and the process KPACs, and when they're applied, our product engineering KPACs, which is the fundamental performance requirements of our product, were used four out of the five process steps. And we didn't have the same requirements before or else in you know, all five of those different um, process steps. So um, this was you know, surprising for me to, to see this, and now we have consistent requirements all through our process. We can see how we're performing um, against those requirements and have real discussions about gaps and um, how we want to resolve those gaps. 
So we have performance visibility on our back end. This is a progression report of our PacWare audits. So you know, for the record, Kohler Company doesn't make any defective product. This is all fake data here, okay, as far as, for the sake of conversation. <laughs> but um, so every column here is a PacWare audit, and every row is a list of the requirements that we, um, we check and inspect to in our, in our PacWare audits. Uh, this is a great example of how I think ours is complex. Maybe other applications are, are more, more complex. But it, it gives a, a nice example, a vis visual of where um, there's a white box that's a requirement that did not apply to that particular product. And then there was a green box. We checked that requirement and we met it. And then the red boxes are where we, we had a gap. So um, now we can see um, at live, at any point in time, how we're performing in our, in our PACWARE audits. And then this is really intended to be a stopgap to identify there's potential issues up, up for, uh, in, our, in our process that we need to uh, raise flags. So before this was a paperwork pro um, process, uh, we would get maybe daily reports, but definitely weekly reports and monthly reports manually. Um, when you're dealing with PACWARE audits, you want to know pretty much hourly, you know, what you're uh, sending out the door. So now uh, supervisors and, and our quality folk can um, um, come in here and pull up this report pretty much um, hourly and, and see how they're doing. The other thing we do have is um, um, we have automatic communication set up. So when there is something that's uh, flagged as a failure in our PACWARE audits, we have our quality folks and our supervisors automatically get an email saying that there's a failure. So live feedback is, is extremely important. So better visibility in the back end, <clears throat> and then better visibility on the front end of our performance. So now we can say, we can use our look across function on any KPAC requirement. So this is um, a look across um, um, for our logo placement requirements. So we have this little sticker, Kohler sticker, that goes above the, um, the overflow in our bathtubs. And it's amazing how difficult it is. Well, you're, you know, we're making 350 bathtubs a day. But um, to get that sticker straight and centered every time, it's, it's a pain in the butt. And so when we, <laughs> we went through fixtures and, and all this kind of stuff. So um, now we can show people how often that we actually you know, meet this requirement. Um, now, the corrective action is to peel it off and straighten it out and put it back on. So it's not that, that big a deal. But uh, now we can go back and say, hey, look, this is, this is not working. You know? Can we come up with something different? And in this particular solution, we, um, we came up with laser logos. So now we're, we're rolling out robots that actually will will engrave, uh, will find the overflow and engrave the Kohler logo, and this problem will go away. So um, um, this is a great example of how someone on the front end of our process can look and see that we're not meeting this um, requirement way in advance in the beginning of our, our development project. And we can make decisions and, and discuss, is this, is this keep doing the same thing that we've always been doing, or do you want to do something different? And here's the, here's the reason why. So. That was huge for us. And then um, lastly here is our um, issues management. So um, we do have a feedback mechanism from the field. So if we get um, issues from some of our customers and distributors, um, we have a biweekly conference call with our plastics plants, our product engineering folks, um, quality engineering and purchasing. And then we will raise an issue on a particular field issue and then as formally assign action items and, and deliverables and schedules that way. And um, formally track all of our, our um, issues that way. Once, once in a while, we'll, we'll, we might tie this to a KPAC requirement, might be, you know, updating a KPAC might be a um, solution, but most of the time it's driving resolution and just, just managing that. So that's a very high level of, of um, you know, how we use Oros right now within um, uh, the showering and bathing group. I can tell you that um, we started out with, 
I go back to our process here. The CAD pattern review was our, our uh, seed project. So we just simply took that application, um, you know, Josh and, and the rest of the team came out and, and, and built the KPAX just for that requirement. And we were able to, you know, test the software and see how it worked. So we didn't have to go to the, the whole Kohler business and say we want to use this, this solution across the whole um, you know, enterprise or business. We could apply it to a very specific application. And once we had success there, then we moved it up and, and down the uh, process until we had the whole process linked. So uh, if there was you know, anything, uh, if I look back right now, maybe we went a little bit um, you know, wide in our um, scope of things before we could really work out some of the details. Um, you know, if I was to go back and do something a little bit different, um, maybe. But um, I think right now what we have is is just a you know, hundred times better than what we had in the past, and um, so far very happy with it. So I guess right now I can open it up some questions if anyone has questions. But what I kind of went over. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for this uh, nice presentation. I have a question. You, you mentioned that you use discussions and issues, but I thought you said you'd prefer to use discussions. Can you explain why you do one over the other? Yeah, I guess we don't have um, a real rigid um, rules in place just yet. But most of the time when we see gaps on um, specifically in our tooling design, our CAD pattern review, it's, um, it's because our, our KPACs aren't robust or we didn't think about the lesson learned, we just learned um, from the plant you know, a month earlier with a, another issue. So there'll, there'll just be a comment from our either CAD designer or engineer that says, hey, this KPAC is missing A, B, and C. And um, we'll go back and, and update the KPAC. So I guess if it's, if it's kind of like there needs to be a, a modification of the K-Pack, it's a discussion. But now if we know this is a hard requirement, bathtub needs to drain water and it's not draining water, we'll, we'll raise an issue on something that's that more black and white, I guess, that we're not meeting. Um, so it is still a little subjective, um, but we got a small group that's using it. We have 30 users right now, and um, I would say uh, probably a third of those are, are just packware audits. So it's really 20 people on the front end of this process that are, that are using that. So it's, um, I think, easy to manage yet that it's an inf handled informally, I guess, in a discussion. Sure. With using the discussion function, are, do you find yourself just using it in the assessment, or are you also using the discussion that is tied directly to that KPAC? Because um, you've got the line item in the assessment, but you also have the discussion function in the KPAC itself that would stay with the KPAC on all assessments. Yes, and we're using, Josh maybe can, can correct me if I misstate, but we're using the discussion in the assessment control, but it shows up in the look across. Let's see if it does. Yes. So this is an example where there was a, um, a discussion on the logo placement that was not correct. And that was done in the assessment control. But now when we look across, it's linked to the KPAC itself. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Or? <laughs> does that answer your question, I guess? It answers the question. Um, I'm familiar with both functions. Um, where I was pushing more was there is another location for discussion um, where in opening the KPAC in the top right, you actually have a discussion option. Um, oh, I got uh, that you, off, the I? If you go back to the picture, you have of just a KPAC. Uh, I think it was your slide with the three. In the top right, uh, it's the second, or the uh, far right icon. Um, kind of looks like a cartoon bubble, and it allows you to put a discussion comment on the physical K-Pack, 
It doesn't show up in the look across oh. or in the assessment, but it triggers um, emails and notifications to the authors of that community with that discussion comment. So it allows you to, as the organization gets larger uh, that's using it, trigger information back to that authorship instead of waiting for somebody to see it in a look across, but also still not formally have to raise an issue to say, hey, you really should look at this. It'd be nice to have an image or something like that to improve the KPAC. That's good to know. Yeah, and then the communication goes directly back to the author. Um, on, your, on your logo placement, um, have you ever had a situation where the robot came in as a maintenance worker is bending over the machine and, and get the back of the maintenance worker? Yes. And, oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I had a question about where you think you're at with the maturity of your process. I mean, um, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about, you know, do you feel like you're getting to that, that knowledge delivery um, goals that you've set for yourself? I mean, would you say you're about 50% there? You feel like you're, you're there already? I mean, where do you? As far as the, 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 in the problem statement, um, I would think we're close to 80, 90% there. So there's always opportunity. Um, um, you know, we did pick the high, you know, the 80-20 rule for the um, um, the knowledge packets that we that we created, the application and uh, the, the assessment controls. So there's other um, uh, less frequent situations that we probably need to to add to the system. But um, I think the the vast majority of the issues we had with tooling and launches in the last, um, you know, say two to three years, we kind of did a, um, um, an analysis of our performance in, in the past, right? Kind of made a list of all the, the lessons learned and the issues we had, and then went in Oros and seen if, you know, to confirm that those were all captured and they were all captured. So, you know, I, I sleep a lot better at night knowing that you know, we keep using this tool, I know we're going to be, you know, capturing and, and evaluating against those new requirements. Um, that's a good question. Not a formal one. Not a formal one. I guess that's the only way I can answer that. So we do have, you know, time to market, you know, um, our cost, our, our budgets, uh, standard cost targets for any launch. Um, but a lot of those are so different depending upon the launch, you know, if it's more elaborate or, uh, or uh, you know, just adding another size and they go quick. So it's not a real easy way of, um, you know, a single benchmark across those. Hi. Well. Hello, okay, sorry. Um, just one comment on the comments. Um, just so that you know, just in, if you decide to do them within the KPAC or within the assessments, within the KPAC, the, only the person that put the comment in can delete that comment. So if you have high turnover and people leave, their comments will stay forever and forever. But in an assessment, the author of the assessment or an admin within the group can delete their comments so that you can get rid of them. We've looked at using both ways, and that's the one thing that we found difference between the different comments. So just be aware, because we've got comments from people I have no idea where, how long they've been out of our company for, and they are just sit there. And I think I've asked these guys, how can I delete them? And no one gives me, I can't. So, <laughs> so just be forewarned by using those comments. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Hey, Jim, thanks. Um, just a quick question on how many assessments you have. Like, what is the frequency you mentioned? misplacement of a label, is that a, are you actually running an assessment per day or per product line or per every product or, so for, and then who creates those? Yeah, so for Packware audits, they're auditing, um, I would say three to five tubs a day, five days a week. So you're in that, you know, um, you know 15 or higher uh, assessment controls a week just for Packware audits. And our quality technicians will generate the assessment control. So we set up the, um, now I kind of wish I had uh, this live, I could show you. 
but I can show you later if you're interested. Um, but it's a single community practice for PACWAR audits, and they go into their um, um, KPAC search, and then we got uh, material set and product type uh, for them to select. And so they'll say it's acrylic FRP and it's an alcove bathtub and generate the assessment control and all the requirements that they need to um, inspect that tub to show up. And then they will take the overall measurements and warpage checks and that and collect the data and put it in the data table. And then they mark the assessment as complete. If it passes or fails, it's complete. But as soon as something is marked as a non-conformance, then there's an email that goes out to the supervisors to let them know. Now, as on the other side of our process for you know um, design reviews and our tooling checklists, those are generally generated at the at the beginning of our process. So we know we're going to manufacture. Um, we have to build three or four tools for this project. We will, the engineer will create those four assessment controls for those tools at the beginning of the project and then within the um, project board, we can see our progress, um, how we're, how, you know, our progress to, through those four assessment controls. Is that gonna make sense? Yeah, yes, thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. Um, could you go back to your roadmap, your very first slide? Yeah, in your tech design review, mm -hmm. um, do you do uh, compatibility checks with your design um, in that particular phase? And uh, using Aorus uh, as a uh, issue management tool? Um, yes, and yes when there's a significant deviation, I guess. So. A compatibility check as far as um, manufacturability, right? And, or as, as uh, component to component uh, interfacing, mm. as well. I guess I'm not too sure what you mean there. Well, I mean like if you're putting parts together, uh, do they go together properly oh, yes. in CAD? Yes, definitely. They they go. They, they we we model them together, and we check that they they match together. And, and then you use ORS to use that issue management to see if it fail, if it if it complies or, or what have you. So what we, what we do in that scenario from product design is that there's um, usually some iterations there that will go on. So if, for example, um, a fit isn't quite right, the radius on the rim doesn't match the radius of the shroud. Um, we don't manage the action items in ORS for that particular. Um, scenario. The, the CAD designer is right there as part of that review and he kind of makes a, a checklist off to the side of the modifications he needs to make to the, um, uh, to the model and then we'll run through the assessment again. And the final check is we do upload screenshots and data into the assessment control in the KPAC. So then when we say it's approved and complete, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time we're meeting all of those requirements. Is there another one? So. Yep. I just have a question real quick. So you talked a little bit about how you had an Excel process before and how you're now using Oros to replace that Excel process. Can you just talk a little bit about how you manage like the change. So people were used to using the Excel file. How did you either convince them or how did you get them to start using Oros consistently? So the, the message um, that we communicated um, from the very beginning and throughout the whole process was that the, the process isn't changing. We didn't, we didn't change our launch process. We're not changing the deliverables that um, the organization is asking from us. We just wanted to do the work within Oros. We wanted to do the evaluation. We wanted to collect the data um, within Oros. And there's, um, you know, for example, in our in our test labs, there's a separate system where we need to um, the test labs required to upload an Excel document into their own system. Um, so there, 
we're, we're trying to convince people to do the work within Oros, then use an Oros output um, into Excel and then put that file, push that file into the system. So we don't change what they're doing and, and how they're recording um, um, their, their information, but we're just do, still doing the work within Oros and tracking the performance within Oros. Um, so that was a, the, the, significant, the significant message. So did you have any, like, oh, sorry. Did you get any, I guess, pushback when you tried to do that, or was it a pretty easy process to convince people to start doing it? It was surprisingly easy. So the most of our most of our departments, our, our groups, did see the value in this, and um, um, I was expecting more pushback, quite frankly. <laughs> but uh, um, we still have um, you know some opportunity within our within our test labs, but um, and even on some of yeah some of the verification reports. But um, for the most part, we did get folks to use Oros, Oros for this. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.